We've got Bill Nye here. How many people here were singing in their heads, Bill Nye the Science Guy, the theme song? We love that song. Coming up here. In fact, the sound guys back there, they've been playing that song for two days. And, and they're fine. Loop. They're yeah. fine. A Bill little Nye shaken up, but guy. we love that song. Inertia is a property of matter. That's a, a <laughs> not a false fact. That's sort of uh, Newton's first law. If 13-year-old me could see me right now, he would be so impressed. This is probably the pinnacle of, of his career. So, Of the 13-year-old? Yep, 13, yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we are all time travelers going one way. So far that we know of. Yeah, no, but it's real. The evidence is overwhelming. And another, <laughs> another in, uh, thing to keep in mind is to transition. We're going to talk about my new show. <laughs> But, but before we do that, I, I do want to say congratulations, because we're going to be talking about some deep, dark stuff, the end of the world. Yes. But first, <laughs> congratulations, you just got married. I did. Yes. <laughs> to, uh, to, a, to a woman. <laughs> People still, you know, it still goes uh, on. Let, let me ask you this. Did you, did you have time to take a honeymoon? We took a mini moon. A mini moon. Yeah. We went to Monterey Bay. Uh, overlooking the, you know, Monterey Bay. Is anybody from there? Probably are, yeah. So it's unique. You know, you have this very deep ocean right next to shore. So it's where oceanography, a lot of oceanographers go there to study. You know, we discovered all these crazy organisms that live very, very deep. I digress. Uh, but the ocean is the key to our future. Back to you. Well, the ocean is also... I, I, you, you set up the segue perfectly because we're going to be talking about your show. Your show deals with the ocean. How many of you watched his show uh, 23 years ago is when... Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yep. All right. How many of you knew he had a new show coming out? Okay. Maybe one, two. How many of you have seen the trailer? No one? Perfect. We've got it for you right here. So check this out. So it's, yeah, it's the super tease. Look at that, our beautiful blue planet, teeming with living marvels. It looks so peaceful, but all isn't what it seems. I'm Bill Nye, your tour guide to the end of the world. Viewer discretion is advised. Get ready for the worst day on Earth. The biggest extinction event since the end of the dinosaurs. Brace yourselves! Tsunamis are now happening all along the Pacific Rim. Nuts? Oh. Earth is constantly on the edge of disaster. This is the big one. With threats coming from everywhere. Go back to your lab, egghead. Leave the drill into daddy. No one, I mean no one, is safe. Not even me. But there is hope, people. It doesn't have to go down that way. The power lies with us to predict, prepare for, and even prevent world-ending disasters with, you guessed it, with science. The Earth is in our hands, and it is up to us to keep our amazing planet alive and well. Get back to your cubicle, James. <laughs> Not today, Fluffy. The end is a long way off, because together we can, dare I say it, change the world. The end is nigh. <laughs> uh, woo, uh, that was that. I looked a lot like Seth MacFarlane, that rough... Yeah, yeah, so Seth MacFarlane is one of the executive producers. He's a cameo in every episode. And always the good guy, right? No, <laughs> no. Now, let me ask you this. The first episode, we were talking about it, and right off the bat, you said Category 6 hurricane. Category 6 hurricanes, they're, they're a real thing. They exist in, right now only at sea. You know, uh, anybody, from, there are a lot of people from New Orleans here, right? Everybody talks about Katrina. Wow. That uh, was Category 5, you know, so, which is big. But there are Category 6 ones that occur in the open ocean, and the climate scientists, you know, Mike Mann, Michael Mann, uh, Gavin Schmidt, and uh, Kate Marvel, and these people, they're concerned about a Category 6 coming ashore, 
which would be a drag. It would be a drag, but that well, will be a drag. That's not even the plot of the first episode. It's, no, it's well, not just one. Yeah, there's five <laughs> at the Is same time. Is that possible? Well, that's what the worst case or a bad case computer model indicates. Yeah, that you'd have all of these things happening at the same time. And an interesting point. <laughs> Uh, is that uh, we never use, in the, that episode, we never use the phrase climate change. Never say it explicitly. But you do, in the first episode, you have this thing that you call act of cow. The act of cow. What does that mean? So uh, apparently it is also a racist or culturist term, but uh, there was a fire in Chicago where the whole place burned down, and it was blamed on Mrs. O'Leary's cow, who was supposed to have kicked over a lantern in a barn with straw that started a fire on one side of the river and the wind was unfavorable and it just was a mess. It burned down the whole place. And uh, so it's negligence. You shouldn't have an open kerosene lantern next to a pile of straw or hay if that's what really happened. And so human negligence is the act of cow and so in all six episodes, we have the act of cow. The act of, we blame it on the cow. Human negligence, but we blame it on... Well, the cow is yeah. going to do, do a cow thing. I mean, you know, you've been around. Yeah, sure, I, I'm going to lower this just a little. There you go. I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure you've probably seen the news today. Oh, it's very I saw relaxing. the news right yeah. after I watched the first episode, and I, I'm wondering... Does uh, everybody hip to what happened today with the Supreme Court? Okay. For, everybody, really? You guys are so savvy. So for, they for, those that that have, the, for those that have been on a news detox here in Aspen... Or and, for some reason, yes. you know, we're taking the morning off. Too bad, because we're talking about the end of the world here and climate change and all those things. So, a uh, quick recap. Uh, today, the Supreme Court issued a ruling that restricts the EPA's ability to regulate uh, carbon emissions uh, from power plants. And so there's still a lot of debate over how far that's going to extend. Um, but at, it appears as though right now the EPA is going to be a lot more limited in its scope with the Supreme Court saying that a lot of this should be in the hands of Congress and you know, it's going to be up to Congress to, to make these laws. So That's great news. Act of cow? <laughs> what do you think? Uh, that's, the whole thing is an act of cow, I guess. But it, it's not. The act of cow is a dramatic... Uh, thing for the television show. But, Filibuster's not act of cow? Uh, wow. That's big thinking. <laughs> uh, so everybody, what we got to do is pass better laws. Uh, and, you know, the Supreme Court does what the law says, so we just have to pass laws that are more um, direct, more specific, more in everybody's best interest. And so uh, the Environmental Protection Agency was created during the Nixon administration not known for his raving, progressive, <laughs> bleeding heart liberal point of view, but uh, uh, that was a long time ago. And so that was using the Environmental Protection Agency to control greenhouse gases was something that worked legally. But now, I mean, we can wring our hands and run in circles screaming, but now we just got to pass better laws. So everybody, people say to me, Bill, Nye, Science guy, <laughs> what can I do about climate change? And to be sure, recycling the bottles, very, don't throw the plastic away, at least let's start there. All right. And then compost your compostable things. But if you want to do one thing about climate change, it's vote. Everybody, please vote. And if you're a kid, you're a kid and you can't vote yet, make sure your parents vote, hassle them. Be, you know, a kid. <laughs> no, if you want parent, if you want grown-ups to recycle bottles, get kids excited about recycling, then they become insufferable, as you may know. <laughs> so if they, and then take the environment into account when you vote. Don't just vote for, with respect, dumb stuff. Uh, vote for better laws to control climate change. And the Supreme Court, you know, it's a controversial bunch right now. And you've been looking at this whole issue for quite some time before most, I would, I would argue. Uh, when you look to the future, you optimistic? Or I yes. mean, your show is the end is nigh, so. Yeah, well, so here's, what, here's an interesting thing. Uh, <laughs> when things are going well in the world, we all go to watch romantic comedies and comedies and comedy shows. Ah, oh, it's really fun. But when things uh, are not going well, like when there's a pandemic, 
everybody rents the movie Contagion. Yeah. Outbreak, uh, we, yeah. <laughs> we, no, it's this weird thing. It's surprising human, or maybe surprising in a way. Uh, when things are going badly, then people watch disaster movies. And so disaster movies have been around forever, or as long as there have been movies. And so we've made six one-hour disaster movies. That's what this The End is Nigh is about. So uh, the first episode is climate is not, uh, not explicitly climate change, but it's climate change. And uh, I, it looks like I get killed. At the end of the first half hour in all six episodes, I get killed. You, I mean, you get killed. It looks very... Yeah, you're pulling the Kenny from But South then Park. in the second half hour... If we, if we just did these things, put these systems in place, everything would be great. That's the second half hour. So, because there's some natural disasters you can't control. Mm -hmm. If the Pacific tectonic plate does this, uh, there are going to be tsunamis. So, let's prepare for it. You know, I can tell you from personal experience, in an earthquake, even if you have 10 seconds, uh, that's a lot. Well, let, let, let's go through some of those one by one because they're, each one of them is extremely fascinating. I'm really popping the mic uh, here. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. When it comes to the first one, when it comes to uh, category six hurricanes, I'll hit five of them. Time. Yeah. What? You're saying things can be done. You're saying there's science to make that uh, possibly avoidable, uh, like or controllable, or not everything suckable. What? <laughs> What are those solutions? What do those look like? Delusions or solutions? <laughs> I think they're both. No, it's, it's, that's the so-called Freudian slip. So uh, uh, what you would do is reduce greenhouse gas emissions so the world doesn't get warm as fast as it's getting warm. And the problem is the ocean's getting warm. And then all this heat energy stored in the ocean leads to this, these up and down convective things in these big hurricanes. So let's reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thanks, Bill. That's easy enough. <laughs> and then uh, there's been this extraordinary study that if you had enough wind turbines, turbines, people, the NBC people wanted me to say turbines. <laughs> no, one, no one says turbines. He said turbines, guys. We're good. <laughs> wind turbines. Uh, if you had enough of them, uh, you could slow a hurricane. And this would be off the coast of... Whoa, 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 Georgia, hold on. You're talking about a hurricane coming in, blowing yeah. wind, and the wind, miles an hour, the wind so. turbines almost act like a speed bump? Yeah. Well, you take the energy out of the wind and put it into electricity. Yeah. That'd be cool. But it'd be enormous investment. And you know how we all work together for the public good. All the time. <laughs> it would be an enormous investment, but it's a fascinating idea that you just can't... See, the, the big idea of the show, everybody, the message I want to drive home what I'm pitching is that there are so many of us now. You know, when, I, when my grandparents were born, there were about a little more than one and a half billion people in the world. And the story I tell all the time, it's not very long. Uh, I was at the World's Fair in New York, New York in uh, 1964. <laughs> I was nine years old, and the uh, United Nations had a display of the number of people, estimated human population. And it, we had just missed it, my family, changing from 2 billion, 999 million, 999,000 to 3 billion. Well, now there's almost 8 billion people. And so we are having a huge effect on the world. So when I was a kid, nature was separate from us. Like you'd be at home, like you'd go camping, was this extraordinary adventure, you'd go out, you know. Okay, and then nature was separate, but now we are in control. That's the big message. Humans are now the stewards of the whole thing. So we have to take the whole planet into account all the time. It's a big, it's a shift in the way of looking at the world. That's the message of the show. So there, that's done. Perfect, we're good, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, so actually, no, it gets even worse because it almost seems what as though- What do you mean worse? It's more of an opportunity. Your climate change episode is the easiest one to solve, at least in terms of, uh, we, we, we can well, see a roadmap. Maybe. What happens in episode two through six? So two, everybody, uh, anybody from Wyoming, anybody from, uh, everybody been to Yellowstone National Park? What does the Park Service love? What are we crazy for? Super volcano. The super volcano exploding. And so, yes, if you live near the super volcano, it's catastrophic. <laughs> if you're camping and a hot lava falls on you, that's a drag. But the bigger picture, is anybody from Nebraska? 
Anybody from Nebraska? If you ever get a chance, anyone, go to Ash Falls State Park, Nebraska. Let me just say, OMG. So this is a place quite a ways from what is now Wyoming, you know, 1,000 kilometers, 600 miles or something from Wyoming. And about a million years ago, not 66 million years ago, a million years ago, the supervolcano erupts and buries all this area. There are these rhinoceroses, three-toed horses, running around in what is now Nebraska, and they're all buried, and they're buried so perfectly, it's like a freaking Spielberg movie. They're just perfect. They're so perfect. How perfect are they? How they're so perfect. <laughs> How perfect are they? <laughs> they can, thank you. You can see the seeds in their tummies. You know what they were eating. And so they were buried a couple times. Apparently there's a watering hole, and the animals went up there to get some relief. Whoa, and then they got buried again. And so the thing that would be, that would be really catastrophic is the farmland. The crops would all be buried in a huge layer of ash. And then <clears throat> even now, you know how... Uh, grain from Ukraine is affecting food supplies worldwide. If you buried the breadbasket of North America, U.S. and Canada, man, it would be catastrophic. And not to mention, I mean, this is almost instant climate change on an apocalyptic yeah, level across yeah. the, the that, world, right? Yeah. But so you could run in circles screaming, or what's, you could get ready for it. What's the, what's the science? How do you cool down a supervolcano? Well, uh, this is an extraordinary idea, but uh, people have talked about having a pair of wells where you'd pump cold water down and bring hot water up and direct it. And you, know, you could have underground explosives and all kinds of cool stuff, but acknowledging that it's a problem is the first thing. But it's a disaster movie, man. Come on, stuff goes wrong. <laughs> Uh, there's actually six disaster movies right. that you just yeah. made That's with right. Mr. Yes. McFarland. So my, my favorite is CMEs. Uh, any, oh, CMEs. Who doesn't love a coronal anybody mass injection? Anybody know what a CME is? Yeah. yeah. A coronal mass, a solar flare. But, uh, and we've had one before. Oh, we just yeah, didn't yeah. have cell phones. And they're big. Solar flare is a, kind of a general term, but it's coronal mass ejection refers to some part of the sun, the corona, that gets shot out into space, huge twisting magnetic fields. So, everybody may remember 1859, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Carrington event. <clears throat> so, this is where these uh, big solar flare happened, and telegraph wires acted like antennas. And bzz, they'd zap, these the fires started in a few telegraph offices and stuff. So, if you, <clears throat> that was apparently was two of these, uh, you know, back to back. Well, if you had two big ones, about a half an Earth rotation apart, you know, 12 hours apart, you'd sort of zap all the electronics of the Earth. You know, when everybody. you say zap, you d it's not just power off, right? Yeah, power off and fires and, and fires. explosions, cool. <laughs> and uh, everything goes dark all at once. And so we have a scene where people are stealing, tele you know, loit loiting, loiter um, looting. looting. Loiterers are looting <laughs> televisions, and the point, you, dude, you can't plug it in. <laughs> and so it really would be a catastrophe. And so then, in the second half, we point out that the vulnerability, you can do analysis, engineering analysis, the vulnerability are our transformers. Those cans you see on top of utility poles. That's the weak link right now. So if we could protect those with something, you know this expression, a Faraday cage? When you have a conductor around, a metal cage around it, the electricity goes around what's ever inside. It's quite striking. Like a fancy tinfoil hat for... A fancy tin, it was discovered by um, Steve Sullivan. No, no, it was Michael Faraday. That's where they got the <laughs> Michael Faraday. Uh, that's where they got the idea uh, for, the, for the name. And uh, so the other problem would be, if, this, if these things happen in a catastrophic scale, which is quite, like, quite possible, the factory that makes the transformers would also be, the factories would also be zapped. And then you couldn't make new transformers. And so uh, 
by planning, by agreeing that this is a real problem, we could get ready for it. But fortunately, that is like tens of thousands of years away, right? That's not anything that's going to happen. It could be time. right now. That's your point. <laughs> it could be eight minutes ago. Yeah. That's how long it takes light to get from the sun, you know. But then, is it like in science fiction, if it happened eight minutes ago in the sun, it doesn't really happen here till it gets here. Whoa. <laughs> All right, so uh, the speed of time. But all that aside, this is a real problem that could really be addressed if we really agreed that it was worth doing. And is anybody from Texas? There must be somebody from Texas. So I know Texans, I used to work in the all patch. I used to work in, I don't want you to be jealous, but I used to work in Snyder, Texas. <laughs> Hobbs, New Mexico. I also spent time in Victoria, the Texas crossroads. Victoria, Texas is one of the five or six towns that claim it's where Nolan Ryan was from. I'm not sure where he was. He's a baseball player. Um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, Texas very prideful that they had their own grid, their own electoral grid, and very prideful that they don't have the man uh, telling them what to do with their regulations. And so when they got even a little bit, I used to work, man, listen to me, people, it was routinely 10 degrees Fahrenheit in Snyder, Texas. I mean, when your feet get cold, that's when you can't think. I just tell you. So if we were to pivot to... Uh, no, so what happened in Texas, sorry, <laughs> is the place shut down because of lack of regulations, lack of respecting what could go wrong, in my opinion. Back to you. If we were to pivot to, to more renewable solar, wind turbines, turbines. Well, and also harden or make it, I mean, it got cold, everybody. Make the, the switching the, sub, the um, substations weather resistant. It, would that prevent a coronal mass ejection and the damage from a coronal mass Well, you mass could ejection? prevent the coronal, you could also rebuild. That's the other thing. After, you know, you, you can't, it's not the kind of thing you can do overnight, but you could certainly do it over 20 years. Right, get uh, enough transformers robust enough to survive it. Yeah, I, I, I'm really excited about going through every single one of your shows because they all terrify me, and I want good solutions on the back end. So, yeah, so we've got one that's very Armageddon asteroid-ish. Yeah. So Seth MacFarlane, you know, who's one of the executives, said, "Conservative media scare people. That's what we got to do. We got to scare people. So we scared you. That's good. Yes." So asteroid impact is a real thing. So uh, as you may know, uh, I had a very good physics teacher in high school. He encouraged me to take the physics AP exam when it was this new thing back in the disco era. <laughs> and uh, through this some sort of clerical error, I went to Cornell University. And then, after I finished my engineering requirements, I took one class from this famous guy, Carl Sagan. And it changed my life, you guys. So I, he started the Planetary Society in 1980. I joined, I sent, um, I got a letter in the mail. Uh, I'm sorry, this was, was a long time ago. It was, plant, it was information storage, plant-based information storage. <laughs> uh, and I responded to it. <laughs> Came in a, a pigeon, right? Yeah, pigeon. Well, it was the postal. We used to have a postal service that was supported by tax dollars and stuff. It's <laughs> Section A, uh, Article One, Section <laughs> Seven of the Constitution. It's not about making money. It's about providing. Okay, it's a different idea. And uh, um, so uh, I joined Planetary Society. I got on the board. Now. Uh, I was at a meeting, I guess I left the room or something, and now I'm the CEO. <laughs> and we work very hard in what we call planetary defense, keeping the Earth from getting hit with an incoming. This is a real thing. So when I, I'm telling that long story because it's been going on a long time. People have been talking about asteroid impacts for a long time. And when I was in elementary school, there was no good hypothesis. Mrs. McGonagall read to us from a big book, the reason the ancient dinosaurs went extinct is they had small brains. <laughs> so the rabbits took all the dinosaur food. And, <laughs> dinosaur, and even she was re like, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I mean, look, that's a rabbit. 
and I'm a Tyrannosaurus. Oh, no, wait, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. You know. <laughs> so you guys, I mention it because I was out in the, I was paying taxes in 1980s when the asteroid impact, it was now Chicxulub, Mexico, was discovered. Walter Alvarez, Louis Alvarez, Alvarez, and now it's the that's the accepted theory, hypothesis for what happened to the ancient dinosaurs. We just don't, it, you know, as we say, very low probability, very high consequence. It's like uh, we've all. I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have seen Don't Look Up, right? Uh, so I watched Don't Look Up, and then I consumed everything I could afterwards to figure out whether or not we were ready in case this happened tomorrow. And I still don't have an answer. Well, so what we want to do is deflect it. Give it a nudge. But if, it, if that was happening today, would we be able, planetary defense in place, would we be able to prevent something? Well, the whole, the whole thing is time. If you have 30 years, then you can give it a nudge, you know. <laughs> nudge, and, uh, but if you don't, then you're going to get into some stuff that's controversial. Oh, just send a nuke out there. Just take a nuclear weapon, set it off right next to it, you know, and then, it'll, and then give it a nudge. Okay, maybe. <laughs> Uh, but a lot of asteroids are what they call rubble piles. They're the mutual gravity of not especially big rocks holds them together. They look like one object, but you know. so anyway, with time we could do it. So the Planetary Society, we work very hard to influence, especially the U.S. Congress, to fund missions like uh, Neo Surveyor, Near Earth Asteroid Surveyor, Near Earth Asteroid um, detecting. Near, the, near Earth object detecting spacecraft. So as we say, it's like looking for a piece of charcoal in the dark. Uh, very difficult to see asteroids and comets or comet fragments, but they do glow in the infrared. They're like 200 Kelvin, 100, 150 degrees above absolute zero. So if you have the right gizmo out in space, you could see them. It's like the James Webb Space Telescope. We're all waiting for it to get cold. <laughs> You know, we launched it last year. It takes months for the thing in deep space to get cold enough to uh, get these very s s tiny heat signatures. But in the episode, what happens is... It's not an asteroid, right? It's a comet that goes by Jupiter. And Jupiter's gravity is so strong. How strong? Thank you. It's so strong <laughs> that it pulls the comet into what ast astronomers call a string of pearls which was uh, hypothetical, but now with, we've looked at moons of um, Saturn, Jupiter, and you can see, bup, 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 bup. it happens like often enough, <laughs> this, um, these impacts. Anyway, a few of them hit the Earth. Whew, that was close. A little bit of damage. But then, <laughs> a year later, a big piece comes back coming at us from the sun, so you can't detect it very easily. Like, if you've ever been a bird or a fighter pilot, you attack from the sun side. They can't see you, blah, ha, ha. <laughs> and then there's 11 days to do something. That's 11 days is a million seconds. <laughs> so we have a countdown of a million seconds of what to do. Anyway, uh, it's a real problem, but we could, we really could, <laughs> We really could do it. Now, there's no evidence, you guys, that the ancient dinosaurs had a space program. <laughs> the rabbits have. did, though. They the rabbits, have. they were very there's advanced. Nothing. But we do. And I just remind everybody all the time, uh, uh, the sp our space exploration affects everybody all the time, constantly. What do we, if the weather report today is off 20 minutes, people start complaining. And we watch all the stuff going on in Ukraine, all because we have communications. Uh, and soon, places like this w in the mountains will get the internet from low Earth orbiting spacecraft. Huge businesses are being developed. And the discoveries on other worlds affect us all. The word black hole is just a commonplace. Supernova, commonplace. We just throw these terms around like, uh, like they're every day because they are now. How many people know the phase of the moon? Just a few of us, because you don't need to anymore because uh, we predict the tides and the clocks with pre extreme precision because of space exploration. And you all, some of the young people, 
It's very reasonable that you will be alive when we find evidence of life on another world. Find like fossilized pond scum on Mars. It will change the course of human history. And yet, and I, and I have a bone to pick with you about this, and yet, no alien invasion in this season. No, no, there's almost, you guys, maybe. Uh, and people say, do you believe in aliens? It's not something you believe in. You know, it, just we have 200 billion stars, 200 billion galaxies of that many stars. There's got to be somebody, you know. But the, getting from there to here is really difficult. <laughs> No, I mean, it's really difficult. You know, uh, the Voyager 1 spacecraft is now 17 light hours from Earth. Launched in 1977. 17 light hours. And it's still in the solar system, really. I mean, you, getting to another world is really hard. Now, Back to I, you. I, I do want to ask, on behalf of everyone that's from California here, anyone from Los Angeles? Yeah. Earthquakes. Yeah. Earthquakes. That is, we're overdue. On, and, and that's a... A common theme in a lot of these. We're overdue for a, uh, a coronal mass ejection. Uh, yep. We're overdue for a pretty sizable earthquake. Yep. yep. In Los Angeles. Yep. What? What? What do you do? I mean, first of all, you can't stop an earthquake, right? Yeah. Not as far as we know. So in the uh, last episode, the the Pacific plate, the uh, tectonic plate, does this huge tsunamis and stuff. So I. Uh, I can tell you, I've been in, er in Seattle, where I lived for a long time. I've been in earthquakes. If you get 10 seconds, that's a lot. If you get 30 seconds, that's really good. The old saying, uh, uh, earthquakes don't hurt people, buildings hurt people. You got to get outside. That's really the first thing. And then you got to build buildings where they don't kill people. You know, this thing in Afghanistan, a thousand people, one minute, killed. All the livelihood, all the algebra they took, everything just sucks. So we got to have buildings that are robust in areas where you need them. In California, uh, Pacific Northwest, do you know this expression, the ring of fire? The uh, California, you know, South America, North America, around Japan, uh, Eastern Asia, uh, uh, all are on this tectonic system of tectonic plates. So you, you got to prepare for that. So let's do that, people. Let's make the buildings robust. Well, that's going to cost more money. I know. But when they <laughs> collapse, it really is expensive. Yeah. No, it really, you know, this is a big thing. Is it, when you don't plan, when Texas decides we don't need regulations on our electrical system, when it goes wrong, it's very costly. And everybody ends up paying for it. Wow, 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 wow. Yeah, I know. I mean, you're talking big budgets on preparing for almost every single one of these. Yeah, what, but what's the alternative? It well, sucks. I, I do want to ask, which one do you think is most likely? Well, they're all likely. Uh, super volcano is not especially day after tomorrow. But uh, moving, you know, a few years ago, there was the earthquake was so big. How big was it? That the Earth's axis shifted a little <laughs> measurably for geologists. So that's, earthquakes are going to happen for sure, absolutely. Climate change is happening for sure. Uh, coronal mass ejection any minute. Uh, <laughs> no, really, I mean, it can happen any minute. And so let's, the sooner we get going, the better. Come on, people. And then uh, one of the episodes is about, we, we became fascinated with the Dust Bowl. Those of you who may have or pretended to have read Grapes of Wrath in high school. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're pumping down the Ogallala Aquifer in uh, California, the Great Basin, a.k.a. Ne Nevada, pumping that water out to graze crops. And if we pump it down too far, we won't be able to feed everybody really fast. And so the Dust Bowl in the 1930s was a combination of change in weather pattern, but it was really a human-caused climate disaster. The Dust Bowl. And it could happen again if we're not attentive. And that was also something where we addressed it with a, a human solution. That's right. Yes. The, the bleeding heart liberal top-down <laughs> nanny state government showed up and said, don't plow this way, plow this way. And it changed everything. So, uh, you know, there was dust falling on the desks in the old executive office building in Washington, D.C., blown there from Oklahoma. And that's when it really got politicians' attention. And with the, 
No, it did. It's a real, that's not apocryphal. With the water situation that we see today in Lake Mead and, and elsewhere, do you think we're, we're close to... Yes, I'm worried. <laughs> so vote, people. Uh, yes, I'm worried. And, you know, you guys, we can do so much to conserve water. You know, we're just so spin-thrifty with our water. And I'm all for being, you know, finger-wagging. You, should, you shouldn't take a shower and... Then, but uh, what we want is clean water for everybody all the time. And that's a solvable problem. Come on. We can do this, people. We can do this. And with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. And you were right at the, the first up. Uh, we've oh, got good. a mic coming Thanks. your way. And did you say you were from Wyoming? Miami. 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 It's Miami. It's a, they're right next door, right? Home of the hurricane. <laughs> uh, my name is Leisha John. I'm the chairwoman of Earthwatch Institute. And... Yay for, yay for citizen science. Uh, my question is this. If the EPA cannot regulate greenhouse gas emissions, do we not need to look toward a market mechanism like a price on carbon? Well, I mean, how else guys, are we going to get out of this? Price on carbon, uh, not to be the so-called uh, silver bullet. Wait, it would be really like jet black right. bullet. If we had a price on carbon, we could get this done in 20 minutes. I mean, if I may whine and complain. No, but... The model I'll give you, you know, is anybody from Alaska? You were from Alaska. So Alaskans get a dividend uh, from the oil and gas industry because they decided the whole state benefits. So even if you don't work in the industry. So if we had a carbon, we could never, I almost used the T word. <laughs> if we had a fee on carbon. <laughs> uh, if we had a fee on carbon, we would motivate everybody right away. I mean, and then what to do with the money, you can get in a fist fight in the social sciences bar about that. But if we, if there was a, a fee on what it costs to drive a car, what it costs to run your, uh, keep your house too warm, run your air conditioning too cold, and then if you were industry and there were a fee on that, we would be so motivated so quickly. Everybody, you know, these lights are all light-emitting diodes. When I first started in the business, <laughs> all the lights were super hot incandescent lights that used, 50, in some cases, 20 times as much electricity. If you use a 20th of the electricity for this fundamental thing, you have a lot more electricity. And so then you wouldn't have to pay a fee on that other 19x that you were wasting or using on old technology. We would motivate the creation of, of um, much more efficient technology really fast. I mean, and this is, you would think it would be easy, wouldn't you? But there's people that are just inherently opposed to taxes, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> inherently opposed to the fees. Uh, fees. And, uh, you know, the, you guys, I know I'm sure here in Colorado there's some strident, very well um, very thoughtful people who can argue very well libertarians here. I'm sure fabulous. But the fundamental problem with libertarianism is we do not all get the same start. Everybody did not start at the beginning. And we, uh, yes, yes, I know, I know, I know, but we have bootstraps, we work hard, yes, we got born poor, now went to Harvard, and I, I've heard all that. But I'm talking about most people. We did not all start at the same part on the racetrack of life. So what does everybody complain about from the time they can complain? How old is your, you have a two-year-old? Oh, one-year-old. I think they kicked her out. She was being noisy. She's somewhere back there. Yeah, but the two-year-old <laughs> complains about what? Mm -hmm. It's not fair. Yeah. No, it's actually, mine's one, and she's complaining about taxes. Yeah. I want the pigtails right it's there. Not, everybody <laughs> complains about things not being fair. So let's make it more fair. This is easy to say, but a carbon, a fee on carbon. The more stuff you use, the more carbon you put in the atmosphere, the more fee you have to pay would affect everybody. And you know, look, and we'll get to more questions. Sorry for the long-winded. <laughs> so, did you hear her? That was her reaction yes. to your fee idea. Just that <laughs> um, people, is anybody in London, anybody from Britain? Yeah, so what do you guys pay now? Eight bucks a gallon in U.S. figuring? Two bucks a liter? Something like that? Nine dollars a gallon. And people still drive because they love driving. 
So people are willing to pay that high amount, but we can't just do it one afternoon, but over the course of five years, we can do it. Back to you. We've got some questions right yes, here in sorry, the middle. Yeah, there you go. It up. Lightning <laughs> round, lightning round, Bill. It's raining, lightning round. Hello, my name is Akshita Sridhar, and me and my team are here for the Aspen Challenge. So basically, we created a solution to solve the climate crisis. And one of our main motivations was that a lot of our peers, and even me personally, was feeling a lot of pressure when people would talk about how climate change would end the world. We felt a lot of pressure. Like, how are we supposed to save the world? Like, we're what, like 15? Like, what can I do to save the world? So I just wanted to ask you, do you think your new show can motivate people, like, how do you account for the negative aspects of your show saying that climate change is the end of the world? And how oh, can second, individuals so, be part of the solution? So the second half of the show is about how we address, how we do all these wonderful things to address climate change. And the, as I say, I think the biggest idea is that we are in charge now. Humans are in charge. So we've got to make decisions as stewards of the earth. Easy for me to say. Hard for you to do. Well, the way to motivate it is to vote for this thing that happened with the Supreme Court this morning is a classic example. They're going to execute the laws that we create. So let's do that. And uh, uh, I remind everybody, you know, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution refers to the progress of science and useful arts. It doesn't say ignore science. It says the progress. That's Congress's job. So the longest journey begins with a single step. Let's go. And I'm sure my six episodes will redirect human history. So, right next to you. I'm going to have some of this now. Yes, ma'am. What if we can't vote? Like we're 50 I say, make sure the, pe the grown-ups in your life vote. I'm serious. But Hassle them. <laughs> is that, does that answer your question? Now, you guys, of course, don't throw this bottle away. And this is polyethylene thaphthalate. I mean, it's just some, if you showed this to a cave guy or gal, they would be impressed. And, <laughs> and so don't throw it away. I'm not saying we don't want to phase it out and replace it with something better. I'm right there with you. But let's not waste what we have. The key to the future is to do more with what we have. Thank and you. I do want to say, you know, one of the most lasting impressions that I've had in, in this whole climate change discussion, we were doing a story uh, for the Today Show out in San Francisco about exactly that, plastic that was being thrown away. And there was uh, an eight or a nine-year-old, and she was the one that motivated her whole entire family to oh, embrace yeah. recycling. And I remember the thing that still sticks in my mind is I asked her, when was the last time you had a, a plastic bottle? And she knew immediately. It had been like two months ago, but she was like, Wow, oh. that's cool. Yeah, she and was she, able to. But this look, this look of like guilt just came over her, her face. And she's like, oh, it was, I was at the airport and I was, I was really thirsty and, and I had to buy some water. And, and I, it, it's still, like, I still think about it. And just seeing that look of guilt, you know, and then I asked her, I was like, well, did you recycle it? And she's like, there was no recycling. I had that's to throw the it thing. Away. So we need to work the problem from both ends. We need to not only get in the habit of not throwing it away, but have a place to not throw it away. But even talking about that and being vulnerable with adults. Ta so that's another thing. Young, yes. <laughs> what can you do about climate change? Talk about it. If we were talking about climate change the way we're talking about, what else do we talk about on the Today Show? Earthquakes. Uh, no, on the Today Show. I mean, I've been covering UFOs a lot. UFOs. So, <laughs> so you guys, and I, we have more questions. I worked for a while, I'm a mechanical engineer, I worked on Boeing, but later in my career I worked on this fighter plane. I had security. We're not going to have that, no, uh, backstage, no, anybody wants no, to join, no, we're going to have a debate over here. for <laughs> a couple years. They don't tell people. <laughs> the Navy doesn't tell, you know the Army has satellites, they don't tell each other what they're doing. They certainly don't tell pilots just learning to fly fighter planes what they're up to. When you look at that video, be skeptical. A That's Aspen uh, Ideas Fest, we're going to need to schedule another panel for So here's later a on fun today. question. <laughs> Why don't they paint spy planes light blue so you can't see them during the day? Why? They do paint them light blue, and you can't see them during the day. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a question back here. Yes. Thank you. I'm Tamika. I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, and you mentioned Lake Mead. 
I need to know what solution, uh, yeah, that, and all the bodies are floating to the top. Uh, what solutions can I take back to my community? What can I advocate for? I'm, I'm asking from the expert. So, you, got, you know, uh, when you look at Las Vegas Nev from the air, there's a lot of golf courses. And uh, I understand that. But if we had a fee on water use that was high enough, people would do that. I'm not saying not, don't play golf. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, if we had a fee that was high enough, people would be motivated to use that water and maybe in a different way. But what you can do is advocate, hey, you know, we're, we all need this water. So let's not waste it. And, and then people are moving to Nevada like crazy, right? And they all need water. So we need, we need to have, advocate for big ideas. And the big thing is not to throw the water away, to, not, to reuse it. This is easy for me to say. But you're, you live there, so I'm asking you to figure it out, man. I don't know, man. <laughs> And on that, we just, we just ran oh, out of we time. Ran we hit to zero. You guys, thank uh, you so much. I'm before before, before we go, uh, when, is, when is the end is night coming out? Uh, 25th of August. They just announced it. They're going to drop. That's the industry term. They're going to drop <laughs> on, on Peacock, which is NBC. There we go. Uh, on uh, 25th of August, all six episodes. And the reason we did six, I don't know. They gave us six. We were not allowed to do the pandemic. We were not allowed to do totalitarianism. But there's six other ones. And there's season two, hopefully. Season Thank you, guys. Two, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>